so let's uh, let's make a start. So uh, just to explain uh, the agenda for the info share today, um, there will be um, a series of speakers covering a range of topics related to open line systems. So I'm going to start with a 15 minute presentation, giving the background to open line systems and some context and how Jeant has um, used open line systems in our recent procurement. We'll then go on to a audience poll. Um, I'll explain that when we get there. And then uh, after that, Infineera has kindly agreed to talk about their open line systems, uh, the equipment. Um, we have uh, Christian as the speaker there for Infineera. Uh, after that, we'll go on to Uninet. Um, they're the NREN from uh, the um, from Norway, and the speaker there is Kurosh, and he'll talk about a uh, case study for open line systems uh, in their NREN. And then a uh, uh, further 10 minute presentation by Paolo on the uh, GAR experience with open line systems. And then finally, we'll have a uh, speaker from Chesnet, that's Thomas, we'll talk about um, modeling uh, work that's been done in TIP. So that's, that's the agenda. I will now uh, go on to my presentation. This is the first one. Okay, so um, so I'll just explain who I am. So I'm Guy Roberts. I work for Giant. I'm one of the network architects in in Giant, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our experience in Giant with open line systems, why we chose to go with an open line system and uh, what we learned in the process. So back in 2019, our network looked something like this. Uh, we had uh, the blue lines showed a core of dark fiber and the black lines were leased capacity. Um, there were several problems that we'd experienced operating this network. And one of them was um, the short lifespan um, of the fiber leases. Um, they were only uh, six years, five, six years. And uh, by the time we'd built it and settled into operating it, we'd have to go into the next stage of procurement. So that didn't give us this, those short procurement cycles gave us uh, difficulties with certainty. Um, but the, the lease capacity, um, those black lines tended to need um, a renewing every couple of years. And that, that meant we spent a lot of time renewing that capacity, but it was quite slow to upgrade. So if you needed new increased capacity there, you might have to wait wait a year to, to get that increased capacity. So we we decided that we would do things differently um, with the current procurement. Uh, and so what we've done is we've kind of um, I've uh, kindly um, um, taken um, this slide from Infineera. They've what they've proposed, what they've, um, this slide is showing is that fiber is a kind of a resource that ke keeps on giving. That is that um, over the last 20 years, the amount of capacity that you can get through fiber has grown by 200 fold. And this is a very significant um, uh, trend and it's a trend that has continued and we think is likely to, to continue um, because uh, what we're looking for is certainty. So certainty, we, we can get certainty of investment through long IRUs, um, but long IRUs, um, we want a resource that can grow. And if we put long IRUs, uh, that's an indefeasible right of use. Uh, so long contracts on fiber, we want a resource that will continue to grow with the technology. So uh, what, what, what has happened is technology has allowed um, uh, more and more capacity to be exploited from the fiber. But that capacity, that, that technology actually resides within the, um, the, the DSP technology um, in the transponders. So what tends to happen is that the, the fiber itself plus uh, has, has a very long uh, lifespan, uh, could be, uh, 15 years, in, in our case, we've got a 15-year IOU on fibre. The 
rodent equipment tends to change relatively slowly. So we're talking about amplifiers and, um, uh, and uh, things like um, WSSs, so the ability to, uh, to, to switch the light. That technology has maybe a 10 year lifespan, but the rapidly changing DSP that extracts that additional capacity uh, bit rate out of the fiber, that has a relatively short uh, lifespan. So over a three year period, you're likely to see a whole new generation of technology which will extract more performance. So what we uh, decided to do was to decouple the optical part, the rodent part from the transponder part, uh, and hence um, the open line system uh, concept. Um, in fact, we've, we've done it um, even slightly more subtly than that, um, in that not only um, are we procuring uh, IRUs on fiber, but we're also uh, taking out IRUs on spectrum, that is part of a fiber. So maybe a quarter of a fiber, a third of fiber, half a fiber. Um, and that gives us those long-term advantages of being able to slowly extract more and more capacity as we upgrade our newer generations of transponder, transponder technology. Um, but we don't necessarily have to buy a full fiber pair because that can be expensive and, uh, and spectrum uh, is, is, a, is a solution that will give us that ability to, to grow the traffic over time, but with long-term security of IRUs. Where we have smaller amounts of capacity, say least capacity, you know, say in the 100 gig or multiple 100 gig, we look at uh, least capacity still. So this is the um, target topology for the giant build. And what you'll see here is the blue lines um, are now um, mixed fiber and, uh, uh, and spectrum. So we've kind of lumped them together. Broadly speaking, the core of the network is um, uh, dark fiber. And as we go out to the peripheries of the network, for example, Helsinki, we're looking at sharing fiber, fiber that's been provided by our NREN partners in the region. Uh, so for example, Hamburg to Helsinki, we're just using uh, a quarter of the spectrum available on the fiber that uh, has been installed already by the Swedish and Finnish uh, NRENs. Uh, but we still have that long-term certainty, um, but we have the, the, the right price point for the amount of capacity we believe we'll need over the next 10 years. So how did we go about um, procuring our open line system? We went through a uh, competitive dialogue uh, process under Dutch public procurement law. Um, it was an 18 month process that started in uh, April, 2019 and has uh, really only, com only completed in September, 2020. So it's 18 months. So the first stage was um, an OJU notice um, uh, in which, at uh, which point we shortlisted uh, based on a set of uh, high level criteria. You know, are they a reputable business? Are they, uh, are they not bankrupt? Do they have a product that, that's suitable? And that, that got us to those six providers there. Um, and then we uh, asked them to, to, to submit a invitation, or we provide an invitation to submit an outline proposal. Uh, and then we went into vendor dialogue sessions. Um, based on, on that, we then uh, cut down the, the uh, number of vendors down to four, uh, and then they were given an invitation to submit a final bid. And uh, then we went to standstill and framework agreements. So the, um, um, the process for the procurement is we, we, well, one thing that was very important is how we um, scored the, uh, the vendors on their bids. And we put a very high weighting on um, the services part of that process. So that's, um, support and maintenance service levels, and very specifically, the ability to build the giant network. And uh, so that got 50% of the weighting. 
25% on the technical merits and then another 25% on the commercials. And the commercials were uh, really the cost over the lifetime of the, um, uh, that we would be using that vendor. So uh, potentially um, a spend of 23.5 million over an 18 year term, uh, sorry, an eight year term uh, for that. Um, so the, the winners of that procurement were Infinera to build the Jant network, and then uh, four vendors were added to a framework um, by which any NREN can uh, purchase the DWDM equipment or the open line system equipment from, from those four vendors. So Nokia, Infinera, Sienna, and ECI. ECI is now known as uh, Ribbon. So what does this uh, open line system mean in, in practice? Um, so in, in uh, a, a DWDM system, you have two parts. There's um, the transponder, so the um, optical to electrical conversion um, is in the transponder part, and the line system has muxing, um, rotom switching, and amplification. Um, so the open line system uh, is uh, shown in, uh, let's see if I can use a mouse, so it's, okay, can't. Um, in green it, it is mux to mux and then the transponders can be from any vendor. So the, the important thing here is that um, what we wrote the contract so that we can use any vendor we like on the transponders. So it must be open at the interface between uh, the transponder and, and the MUX. Um, and then we can use uh, either colored pluggables in our routers or we can use specialist DCI equipment, but we can purchase those from any vendor. Um, so one of the things that actually would hold that back um, is alien wave licensing fees. So the licensing fees are set by the vendors to make their business models work essentially. So typically they sell the, um, the uh, rodents and amplifiers at cost and they make their, all their profit in the transponders. So to uh, try and fix that, um, they then put a, a, a license fee to force the uh, users, so yeah, the, their customers, that's that's Jean in this case, to pay a license fee every time you use a third party transponder. So we negotiated uh, uh, that out effectively. We, didn't, we, we basically set the rules that we would buy transponders from, from the vendor that provided the whole open line system for the first three years for an agreed amount of spend. But after that, those three years, um, the system would be free of license costs. Now, there are other, other models you could use to go open. Some, some NRENs, for example, have chosen just to say, give us a price for um, uh, license-free operation. So, so no, no alien wave licenses at all. Um, that, that's also a, a perfectly good model for, for procurement. What I want to also touch on is spectrum sharing. So related to open line systems is spectrum sharing. As soon as you have an open line system, you technically then can move into the world of um, spectrum sharing. What this means is that the transponders and that can that ownership of the transponder can move from the uh, line system provider or the, 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 the service provider to the customer. So it's an ownership model difference between uh, an open line system and a spectrum shared system. But the great thing about spectrum sharing is it empowers the users because they have the transponder, they can see what's happening on the line, they can turn up new transponders quickly. So what are the benefits of a spectrum service? As I say, it empowers the users, they have greater control, they can see exactly what's going on in, their, in, in the network if they own and operate those transponders. They can turn up new services much more quickly because they uh, can have transponders in reserve, 
they they just need to 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 go and configure configure those. So it's a much more quicker turnaround model for 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 service turn up. And we believe it's a lower cost service. We can reduce the cost of the services by you know providing it spect selling spectrum at a cost that reflects uh, the cost to us rather than um, uh, the additional overhead of um, you know things like uh, depreciation of of transponders and it also allows because giant is an international provider it will, it will allows giant to um, uh, build for the nrens provide for the nrens international uh, circuits and it reduces fiber duplication within the rna community so giant is now um, in the process of defining a multi-domain spectrum service as part of work package seven um, in gen four three um, and we we have a target date to uh, turn up a, a you know, release 1.0 of a production grade of multi-domain spectrum service at the same time that we have a, a fully built out network which will be uh, q1 20 2023 so uh i think that's all that i want to say uh there um if you have questions uh, i i see we're i'd like to try and keep this process on time so if you have any questions what i would suggest is you um, put those in the chat channel um, and we'll we'll see if we can address those in so what I'd like to do now is uh, run a poll. So just having a look, we've got 25 people uh, in this info share. And uh, I, some names I recognize, some of you will be from NRENS. And some of it will be, uh, some may be from providers or uh, other people. But I've, I've put together a, a poll on open line systems because what i want to do is gauge your uh interest in deploying open line systems and the capability of deploying open line systems within your uh with your own nren so can i encourage people to uh take part in the poll um you should see it there so there are only five five questions yeah, there's only five questions. Should only take you a few seconds. If you if you don't um, own an operator network, um, then uh, it probably doesn't apply to you the poll. But uh, so you don't don't feel uh, the need to to respond. I would encourage people to respond. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to to fill that out, answer those five questions. And that hopefully will give us um, a little bit of insight into how fit people feel about open line systems, whether it's something you uh, would, are interested in deploying or whether it's something you uh, are not interested in. Now we've got half half the audience has responded, which is great. So once you've finished, I'll end the poll and uh, then I'll share the uh, the results of the poll with you and you can see how people have responded. Guy, there are some questions in the chat. Maybe you can answer them. Uh, yes. Is a, so there's a question. Should should be a submit button at the bottom of the poll. I think it's automatic. Um, if you 
you scroll down, as you as you click on it, um, they're automatically registered. So I've seen that um, 17 people have now participated in the poll, and I can see the uh, answers coming up in here. So, so it looks like it's working. This is a new feature in Zoom, I think. So uh, let's see how many bugs it's got. Okay. Um, I think uh, with 17, 70% of the audience has responded. So uh, that's great. So I will now end poll and share the results. So can people see the results there? You should see uh, question one. Uh, I'll just run through the answers. So 17 out of 17 people uh, answered question one and 76% um, have a, an IRU on the, uh, on the fiber and 59% uh, have a lease. So it's more than 100%. So there's some mixture of IRU, lease and own. Um, I did allow multiple choice here, but the most popular seems to be IRU and lease, uh, not much self-build. Okay, so uh, plenty of fiber owned there. The next question is how many kilom kilometers dark fiber in your network? So uh, there we go. We're looking at uh, the most popular is between three and 10,000 kilometers at 35% and then greater than 10,000 kilometers at 29% followed thirdly by um, around uh, 1,000 to 3,000. So we're looking at somewhere an average um, in the three, three to 10,000 kilometers of dark fiber. Um, Moving on to the next question, which vendors? We've got quite a scatter there. Um, we've got Adva 3, 3 Nokia 3, Infineera 6, Sienna 2, Ribbon 4, and other 5. Uh, kind of interested in who the other are. Um, uh, perhaps if you've got other and you're prepared to, to share um, that information, um, I guess there could be sure who the other might be. Um, moving on, um, are you using or planning to use open line systems in your network? Now, this is interesting. So using now is 40, 41%, in the future 35% and not planned only 6%, unknown 18%. So a total of something like 76% um, say yes, they're either using now or plan to use uh, open line systems in the future. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, in terms of how well your vendor is supporting, so of course this is randomized. We don't know which <laughs> which vendor you have, uh, but uh, nonetheless, four out of seventeen say so you'd rather not say. Um, I'm assuming that that's probably because it's not as good support as you perhaps would like. Um, but good to adequate support seems to be predominant. So we're looking at seventy. Uh, Seventy-seven percent of respondents have uh, good to adequate support. Okay, uh, that was very interesting. Thanks everybody for that. Uh, I will now stop the poll. Um, I think uh, next on the agenda we have uh, Infinera. Hello, Christian. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. You can we hear can me hear well, you, which is great. Excellent. <laughs> um, would you like to tr share your uh, if you yes, take share screen yes. button? And... One hundred percent. So I hope you can see it. Very good. We can see your screen. Yes. All right. So uh, we you have twenty minutes. I'll uh, uh, as we run out of time, I will uh, jump in. Okay, great. Yeah, I have so much topics to say, and and uh, really thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here in front of everyone. So uh, I'm Christian Removich, uh, working at Infinera as a director in solution marketing and technical marketing. And um, there is so many things going on on the optical transport domain. You, you, you mentioned nicely the open line systems. 
but there are other inflection points also that is happening right now, which is a great time actually to be in the industry. So optical engines and interfaces, we have kind of like a mantra of 800 by 400 by 100, which I will explain in a bit what this means, which also, also explains why open line system and why the optical layer is so important going on uh, for, for your networks. And then open networking is a huge trend that will also support this open line system, open transponder system, and the way how you operate your networks, right? So these are the three aspects I want to cover. I might not be able to cover it in these 20 minutes, but uh, I will be rushing through some of the slides, but you can get the slides for reference and you can go back then yourself. I hope that's fine. So on the optical interfaces, I think what, you know, what, what is really important to understand is there are like three vectors of optical evolution on the, on the optics, like the performance factor. So how do you really maximize the fiber, the capacity to reach, uh, which means that you need high baud rates, and which means also that your open line system needs to support flex grid. Uh, space and power is another vector, which is also important. So you want to reduce the space and power. However, here the performance is not hit. Right, so here we talk, we, what we see recently is really the 400 gig of evolution. And then system functionality. So each optical interface today has a lot of system functionalities that are important when you operate your network, like a spectrum analyzer, like features like packet and OTN functions, remote management, encryption, in-band communication. And all these, form, all these three factors needs to be considered in optical engines. So when we look at the market and, and you can break it down in access network, metro network, long haul and subsea networks, the historical market for coherent solutions is really right in the core of the network and the subsea. However, we also see a recent trend that more and more capacities are going to the access of the network. So we see GPON being operated to XGS pond. Uh, we see DWDM approaching the access of the network. We see even coherent optical interfaces approaching the network. Um, so here's some like market trends that uh, we capture from Signal AI, Deloro, and Omdia and light counting. And we put this together to see like the market is growing, embedded, pluggable, and direct detect optics, so non-coherent optics. So direct detect will decrease over time, but the pluggables and the embedded optics will grow. So, and, and that's clear. So let's look at first right now at the, um, at the embedded optical engines, which will provide you the best performance. You remember the three vectors? Capacity per fiber matters here, right? So therefore we need the really, really high performance on the optical engines, which cannot be achieved in pluggable form factors. The pluggable form factors is really more optimized around cost per bit being compact, low power consumption and so on and so forth. So looking at the embedded, uh, what we see now is the fifth generation of uh, coherent optics being available. So it's really, it's not overly uh, improving the spectral efficiency. Spectral efficiency means how much data you can put into your fiber, like the fiber utilization. But you know, one aspect of the fifth generation is really the reach. So for example, 600 gig wavelengths can be transported more than 2000 kilometers in a network. Whereas with the previous generation, you could only achieve 100, 150 kilometers with 600 gig per wavelength, right? There is a huge jump in terms of reach and the reach is important uh, we have seen your network, right? European wide network, and um, it, it crosses, uh, you know, a lot of cities and, and regions and kilometers. So you need to avoid regeneration points, right? So, and each generation also helps to reduce the TCO, right? You have less transponders, you have less lasers to use, you have less regeneration points in your network, which makes it uh, easier to manage and less cost uh, and more cost efficient. So with I6, uh, and which is, uh, I'm glad and really appreciate that also uh, you are testing and will deploy I6 also in your network. I6 is really the market leading optical engines and there are only very few uh, 800 gig wavelength suppliers in the market at all. And we have additional features, which for example, will not be able to run all of them into a pluggable form factor. 
uh, like ultra high baud rate, but PCS, sub C modulations, gain uh, factors, super Gaussian shape, dynamic bandwidth allocation, all these aspects we will, you know, I probably you heard about it already. If not, yeah, I encourage you to go to a website or contact us. We will explain how these all these features work in the, in the optical engines. And we have achieved really great results with, uh, with our technology. So here's a, basically a readout. So this is what we uh, tested an 800 gigabit wavelength over 95 gigabaud uh, using PCS, a probabilistic constellation shaping 64 quam in over 1000 kilometers. You can see our wavelength in the center of the C-band and we put noise left and right. So we uh, filled up the entire uh, C-band in the fiber. And on the right hand side, you see um, the uh, signal that we received at the remote side. And these are the digital subcarriers, the Nyquist subcarriers. And you can see here the Y and X polarization. You can see how we dynamically adjust, you know, the PCS on each subcarrier, right? So these are, uh, this is one wavelength that has X and Y polarization and each subcarrier is modulated. Here you see 64 quam and at the edges of the signal, you see less of a modulation. We also have demonstrated that the OFC uh, 100.4 gigabaud operation on the I6 engine using the same PCS 64 quam, and we could transmit two 800 gig wavelengths, 1.6 terabit super channel, putting close together. You can see them here on the bottom left, over 1,600 kilometers over a G65E fiber, which is a large area fiber, which is not a typical fiber that is deployed in the network. But uh, you know, it's a, it's the latest and greatest fiber from Corning. Um, but I want to also say, in the real world, so in practice, where you don't have equal distance spans with eighty kilometers and low noise amplification, there are many factors that you know drive the optical performance. One is how much margin do you allow on the on the network? So typically, you want to have two, three dB OSNR margin. What fiber type you have? Some you know coherent wavelengths are not. <clears throat> not uh, favoring G655 leaf fiber, for example. And sometimes you have a mix of fibers. The fiber quality plays a role. How many splices you have, how many loss you have. Each loss will require amplifier to run higher. And this will introduce more noise, span lengths, channel spacing, number of channels that is running, amplifier types, Raman amplifiers, reduce noise, rodent types. What kind of rodents do you have? Broadcast and select or route and select that will also have a huge impact on the performance. So all these real parameters that you have in a real network where we cannot deploy like say ideal situations will also account for the performance. So keep that in mind. So on the pluggables, um, and, and mostly these coherent optics are used in point to point, but in the pluggables, what we have developed now is a point to multi-point coherent optics and I will skip this session for the sake of time, but I just want, will browse through the slides quickly and encourage you to look at it because this will also change the way we build aggregation networks. So it's actually the first time in the industry that we can connect a high speed laser like 400 gig interface uh, with a lower speed laser with 100 gig interface, for example, in this case, right? So we brace, basically broadcast all these digital subcarriers that you saw on the previous page on IS6. In ISXR, we have 16 of those subcarriers and we can tune at the remote side each laser on some dedicated subcarriers, right? And therefore we can have a point to multi point scenario. A 400 gig laser, for example, would have 16, 25 gigabit subcarriers, digital subcarriers, all done by the DSP. It's one wavelength with 16 subcarriers. And then you have at the edges, for example, 100 gig QSFP 28 DS DS DCO that runs up to four subcarriers. So right, this one here, for example, can tune into um, to some of the subcarriers. But you can also use this in a point-to-point -point scenario. You don't need to use it in a point-to-multipoint scenario. And uh, having the subcarriers will also increase the reach. So we believe that we will be better than the 400 gig ZR plus optics in terms of performance uh, once we have this technology available next year. We have done a couple of demonstrations at Virgin Media, at American Towers, at British Telecom, all really impressed. We made some videos. Everybody is happy, um, makes uh, announcement with us. We could achieve uh, in business cases together with these operators and showed really great results. 
Um, and we will develop this in standard form factors, QSFP, QSFPD, DCFP tools, 100 gig, 400 gig, and 800 gig variants. Uh, there is a roadmap. We will start with CFP2 400 gig uh, next year, and then we will evolve with QSFP28 once uh, the DSP is available. So now you heard about 800 by 400 by 100. So we believe that 800, 400, 100 will dictate the capacities of our optics uh, in the next couple of five, 10 years, right? And we can see also that platforms. Now I'm changing topic to open line system. Platforms are becoming also important, open line systems and compact modular systems. So let's look at open optical line system or OLS. So what is an open line system? To majority of the uh, industry, open means open for third party wavelengths, right? So that there are no restrictions, no physical restrictions, or uh, other limitations to deploy an alien wavelength over a line system. That's one explanation of a line system. And that's literally supported by every line system vendor, right? There's nothing special here. Um, it has to, of course, support the ITUT grid and, and the flexi grid. Once the ITUT uh, standards are met, I believe that every line system in the world supports uh, alien wavelengths. Line system with open APIs, right? So that's another observation, like open in terms of interfaces. And if the uh, solution doesn't provide native APIs on the box itself, you can use an SDN to controller, right? So many uh, vendors are saying we have an open line system. And then in terms of open APIs, you need an SDN controller on top to provide you net content topic interfaces, right? So that's the second definition of line system. So in each is less more and more open. And the last category I would put myself in, into like native support of open APIs within the line systems. And here you have two variants. One is that supports netconf and restconf interfaces with proprietary data models. And one variant where you have APIs like netconf and restconf supporting young data models like open config or open role. Open config is not really available on the line system from standard points of view and is evolving. We will see open config also on the line system coming. But today, for example, open RODEM, young data models are available for the line systems. Okay. So these are the three categories of open line system, <laughs> of open optical line system, sometimes referred. Uh, Flex ILS is our flagship in terms of line system, of open line system. So we support alien wavelengths, we support uh, you know, any wavelength in the industry that follows ITUT grid, has fully uh, flexi grid capabilities within 12.5 gigahertz granularity, colorless directionless, contentionless operation, really, really nice um, uh, solution that we uh, really developed also in terms of super channels, because Infinera, you may remember, has all this uh, wavelengths within um, a super channel, uh, not necessarily, but that's one of the options using ICE4. We also support open uh, interfaces, netconf, however, not the young data models on the FlexILS system. Uh, FlexILS system gives you the flexi grid support that is required to support 600, 700, 800 gigabit wavelengths, and then later 1.6 terabit wavelengths that are coming and so on, right? So your network with FlexILS is ready to support any transponder that is available today in the industry and any transponder that will be available in the next at least five years in the industry. High resolution optical channel monitoring, very important to have control about your wavelengths. Some automation in terms of balancing optical powers within the rodents, very important in order to avoid uh, loss of signals and in, in order to avoid that higher um, wavelengths, higher power wavelengths kill some lower power wavelengths. You need to balance them correctly. This takes time. However, it is very, it has to be very accurate, of course. Uh, twin WSS, so we use also on the drop side, not the broadcast uh, rodents. We also support uh, the route and select rodents, which also reduces noise, and some templates for planning tools that you can support alien wavelengths over such a line system. Talking about the GX as a transponder system, we are evolving GX platform, the compact modular platform, to support 
open line system as well. Today, it has already some of the functionalities, uh, like a nine degree rotor is available today in the compact modular platform. So this is more like for metro networks. This nine degree rotor has a fully open rodent compliancy. And we have done a lab demo at the OFC and I will show you with the open rodent community. We're evolving the solution further in the next year with 20 degree rodents, with Raman amplification, CDC air drops, with 32 degree rodents and further CDC air drops. And we have pluggable optic layer for you know, metro applications and then later in 2022, also for large uh, you know, distances as well. And it will be interoperable with the flex silent system for sure. So this is the nine degree rodent. I skipped this, these are very detailed, but I just want to show you how compact you can build a four degree rodent site. You have four rodents. You have OTDR sitting here as a pluggable. Uh, you have w, uh, a four degree rodent here and the colorless a drop. So this is a configuration of four degree rodent colorless directionless with no TDR for all fibers, all the four fiber directions mm -hmm. and 64 add drop ports. So you can add 64 wavelengths 600 gig wavelengths, 800 gig wavelengths, whatever you want, and then switch them into all the degrees. This is really open rodem in terms of MSA, but also in terms of data models, open rodem data models compliant. And then last but not least um, is open networking. We talked about it. And um, Guy, you also mentioned it at the beginning that there's a huge evolution. And this is uh, really true. And this is, gives you a little bit of an overview. In the past 20 years, we have defined the ITUT frequency grid where we put the wavelengths in. The first reference of alien wavelengths was done 2004. If you look at Google, then you heard about Blacklink, I'm sure. Netconf was invented. Young data models were started. Netcom was further evolved, open rodem MSA form 2016, open config, open line system became a, 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 a language in our in optical networking. You see, open rodem has now a stage 4.0, 5.0, adding three streaming telemetry. The TIP uh, telecom infra project also releases new. So a lot of activities on the open initiatives, on the optic, uh, open uh, fronts. And we see in you know, our first open networking appearing in access, mobile cable, and then and then now finally also in the optical domain. And a lot of operators are driving open optical network uh, networking capabilities. So Guy, I also thank you for setting the stage. <laughs> I didn't know, but you did it great. So this aggregation makes totally sense sense between the optic layer and transponders. Optic layer, typically sales cycle, uh, development cycle of 10 years, transponder every three, four years, there's a new coherent technology generation coming. So it makes sense to decouple them, to have an open line system and have transponders. And then on the bottom, you see another aspect of open optical networking, as I mentioned, are the open APIs. I skipped this one. This is probably interesting. It's also available on YouTube if you browse for uh, OFC demo setup. So we were part of this uh, open rodem demonstration with other vendors. We provided rodem OTN switch ponders, 100 gig transponders, 400 gig max ponders and transponders for open rodem compliancy in this network. And uh, you know they could really operate this network using open rodem uh, data models. So as I mentioned, the system itself provides open rodem data models, provides open config data models for the transponder side. We also have infinera models if you, if you are fine with them. Um, we have all the open configuration monitoring aspects, streaming telemetry, SNMP, NetConf, RESCOM, GNMI, and so on, on the system. Streaming telemetry, also here, we have some new patent or uh, an evolution. It's called adaptive streaming telemetry. Instead of streaming all the telemetry and flooding your network with data, we basically send just a few parameters every now and then. And if we see the activities are increasing, uh, and you want uh, higher reporting on the streaming telemetry, then it will automatically adjust and send more information because something is happening in the network. So it's really adaptive in terms of activity. So now I'm uh, coming uh, to the summary. So our portfolio as it Finera going on is really about network, uh, about automation and control. Let's go top down. We have an SDN controller, we have a network management system, we have an orchestrator. Right, we serve aggregation, metro core, and submarine networks. 
some uh, disaggregated routing using white boxes and CNOS, packet optical transport still, you know, the best year for XDM, for example, was last year. And this year we will expect even more sale. We have an OTN switching platform. We have the GX that you just show uh, that you just saw as well as the Flex ILS on the line system. Our optical engines is the i6, 800 gig capable, and ISXR uh, with the 60 subcarriers solution. Uh, how do how do we deploy? I'm sorry. You know, point to point, point to multi-point pluggables more in the access. Point to point pluggables more in the metro and embedded in the core of the network, right? So this is how we set this up. So thank you very much. We are very proud to be in your network. We love you. We love the, that you support us with press releases as well. Highly appreciated, really. And uh, and we and you are in good hands, right? You have latest and greatest technology in your network. You are ready to go uh, with our solutions. It's really the one of the most modern platforms that you have in your network. And uh, and thank you very much for, for your support. For more information, we have white papers on the website. So feel free to visit our website as well. Okay. All right. Thanks, Christian, think... for that. Uh, great. And for keeping spot on time to the to the to the second. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, I was rushing. <laughs> I, I hope it was not too quick. But since it's recorded, you can go back and listen again. If you... Yeah, uh, <laughs> no problem. Uh, yeah, appreciate that. Um, I do, I have one question. Um, so, um, you talk about um, open config and open Rotom uh, and uh, uh, Yang models. Um, what, from your experience, do you know whether there's much uh, actual adoption of that yet uh, in? In, in networking, or is it still uh, in sort of uh, development and demonstration phase? Oh, it, it's, yeah. Um, it's on the optical layer side, it's really under development. So on the optical yeah. layer side, uh, you know, things are coming and there's a lot lot to do further on going on. Right. Open Rodem is really driven mostly by AT&T and, and they have their few suppliers, right? So that's why they are focusing on Open Rodem including us, for example. But um, on the transponder side, open config is really major. So that's really state of the art almost, I would say. Yes. I believe that the majority of the transponder solutions in the market do support open config young data models. Um, and, and yeah, so on the transponder side, yes. On the optic layer side, still in evolution. Okay. Thanks, that's helpful. Um, okay, uh, I think in the interest of keeping on time um uh, i'd like to introduce so thank you christian again for your you. great very helpful talk um uh so uh i'd like to introduce kurosh uh, from uninet in norway um and he's going to talk about um the open line system uh usage in 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 norway and how how they've deployed multi multiple vendors so uh, over to you, Kurosh. Thank you, Guy. Do you see my presentation? We do. Okay, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, just uh, the outline of the presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about open optical line system. Uh, probably escape this one. Alien wave at UniNet since both Sky and, uh, and Christian actually covered well uh, this one. Alien Wave at UniNet test and provisioned uh, system we have also planned a spectrum sharing. Uh, this is the same slide actually more or less. I just I wanted to describe what we put in op open optical line system as you previously also covered a disaggregation between line system and uh, and. Uh, um, the expanders you say separating the line system from DCI and trans expanders, no uh, spectrum licensing, and also open North Pole interfaces, as you have maybe also seen as point two and three in Christiana's slide. It is, yeah, I'm good in line with also our definition. Uh, I can also add that uh, we have an existing IRU with one of the major operators in Norway, 
it, it uh, the IRU actually we have to renew it, not renew it, but expire actually in 2023. And we are about uh, slowly to build a new network and start it in the northern part of uh, Norway. I had a pre procurement uh, last year, uh, and that one Nokia has been chosen. Um, uh, as you see, it, we are started actually to build in this part. Regarding the Uninet and uh, and the current alien waves, it is you see this current alien wave wavelengths and that that when we planned in 2021, uh, you see the river actually uh, just to give you a, 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 a about the distance from Tromsø to Trondheim, it is about 1,200 kilometer additional from Tromsø to Oslo, it will be about 1,800. Yeah, a kilometer. So it covers very long distances. Uh, the channel rate on alien waves we have today is 100 gig, 200 gig, 300 gig. And the host network we are using, we are using both Global Connect and Sunet. Regarding the DCI we are using today, we're using a mix of uh, GRU from Infinera and also PCA, PSIM from Nokia. So that's, um, that's what we are using today. Um, we have been testing actually alien wave uh, from since 2010 uh, with Cisco, Juniper, and Transmot. Many different uh, of uh, uh, yeah different uh, different tests over Nokia Siemens network, current Infinera optical platform. Also, we have been testing interoperability between Juniper and Cisco over optical Nokia Siemens network at that time. Uh, and many, many more actually. Uh, some, we did this test to, to gain some experiences and to know what we are doing uh, recently. Some recent tests we did with our colleagues in, uh, in Sunet and Funet is one of this one. Uh, actually, uh, what we did, we used uh, um, based on DCI is from, uh, from Infinera, the groove. Uh, CHM, CHM2T uh, module, and also to Trondheim, it is about, yeah, more than uh, 1,400 kilometers. It tried to run as 300 gigabit per second over that. And as you see, it, the, the DCI is from Infinera, and the optical line system is, for, uh, is from, from Adva. Uh, is the same case. Actually, we try to stretch the network and just run it up and down, and to find out actually how much how much we can get from from from, from our line system. And it is maybe since it's that as you see, the the pass we try to to route the pass from northern part of Sweden to south and up again and down and down to Norway. Uh, the distance was about 6,100. Uh, we managed to run 100 gig, um, which is very good. One another very interesting test we did, uh, which is very good actually, uh, in sense with our colleague uh, Yanni, he's in the audience also uh, in Funet. Uh, we used a mix, the, the, the line system is from Adva, uh, but the interesting one thing is that. The DCI usually you are using DCI boxes from from from, from the same vendor. What we did here uh, actually we used Groove in Tronta in Norway, but we used uh, uh, Terraflex in in Kayane, uh, um, and they they did work very well actually over the system. The, the, the system we could establish 300 gigabit per second over almost 3,000 kilometers. Um, uh, this is not a general rule, so just uh, emphasis on that one, actually, is not that the, the module we used for, for, for the groove is what the CHM2T, which is actually as a Akashia uh, chip. And also it is the same in Terraflex, so they, even if you have two different vendor uh, here in this case, they are using the same 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 chip in the, their module. And therefore, 
actually it works uh, quite good. Uh, uh, we had no problem with that to get it up and running. Otherwise, uh, regarding the spectrum use case, uh, ISCAT and ISCAT three is project in uh, in northern area. They, they are they are about to build three huge antenna sites in uh, in in Norway, one in Norway, one in Sweden, and one in Finland. And each antenna site produces about four terabit per second of constant data rate, which will be sent to uh, sent to data center. The data center located in one of these two uh, the antenna site location, and we are sending four terabit per second one way, and and also for redundancy four terabit per second on other way, which makes eight terabit per second on another line system. And it will cross the optical line system from Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So we have to interconnect in two different, at least three different places: uh, Nordnet, uh, Sunet, Nordnet, uh, Funet, and Funet Sunet uh, places. So it makes that we uh, we uh, we, ha we have to uh, reserve about one terahertz of a spectrum, which is tremendously actually high. It's uh, yeah, if you say that you have extended C band, you have 4.8 terahertz of the spectrum. So it makes over 20% over of your total spectrum in your C band. Um, so the, the, that's experiment. It, this site will be come up in, uh, in, in early next year. Um, uh, we did some the lab testing, actually, not uh, directly in that, but to find out how, how it will work. Uh, as you see, what we are going to do that is just simply connect the Nokia Rodam to the Adva Rodam and uh, from from uh, one port to another port and create uh, actually it creates this um, so-called spectrum services or spectrum sharing uh, um, um, by by this level. Um, yes, regarding the operation, uh, alien wave. Uh, or alien spectrum, or you get the shared spectrum. Planning and provisioning are the key elements, and more important actually than a legacy service planning provisioning. So you have to use uh, more time actually to to plan or provision it. Agree on parameter setting uh, from both sides. The joint provisioning you, you should have. We have to do also after provisioning the unusual ticket system to announce the plan work and also events that has uh, any impact on the services. It is a little bit more important from, from, uh, uh, from optical line system operator um, to the alien wave uh, clients. Also, if possible, share the monitoring functionalities uh, with each other actually. Um, somehow to make it enable for your operator to see uh, the parameter you are running on your your DCI like um, yeah TX RX value is very important to see for them but also not not least beta rate and USNR Q factor and this kind of uh, parameters but also last thing is uh, still trust between the optical line system and users is uh, is it still actually uh, important? That is not uh, you shouldn't have forgot that one. That is my talk. Um, thank you very much. Any question? Okay. Thanks, Karash. Uh, yes. Any questions? Okay. Um, if you think of any questions later, just type them into chat, and we'll try and pick them up at the end. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, so uh, our next speech speaker will be Paolo from GAR, who's the Italian NREN, and he's going to talk about uh, their GAR experience on uh, sharing yeah, uh, uh, open line systems. Thanks, Guy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. OK. okay. Good afternoon. Uh, Okay. Again, um, my name is Paolo Bolletta. I work from uh, for GAR in the infrastructure department. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly run through the uh, 
path that GAR is following, starting from alien waves uh, uh, toward the uh, Overland system. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to give a really quick overview of the uh, GAR optical network. After that, uh, um, I'm going to talk about how this journey started with Alien Waves uh, and how it's going uh, with the OLS and the GAR-T project. Um, uh, first of all, GAR runs uh, more or less uh, uh, 15,000 kilometers of uh, optical network owned by IRU. In the 2011, we implement and deploy in the center node of Italy, uh, Tangi, based uh, on off keying uh, uh, DWDM network based on uh, Huawei platform. In the 2015, uh, uh, GAR deploys in the south of Italy, a uh, coherent network uh, based on Infinera platform, uh, able to deploy and provide uh, 100 gig uh, services based on uh, Super Channel. And uh, after that, in the 2017, we started our journey with Alien Waves and uh, opening up uh, somehow the uh, line system, uh, interconnecting the main uh, uh, sites of the GAR network with uh, uh, 200 gig uh, services based on uh, coherent Alien Waves uh, um, upon a, um, comp a compensated uh, DWDM uh, line system. After that, currently we are uh, improving and uh, uh, um, deploying a, a new uh, fiber footprint in some area of the uh, of the network, and we are also refreshing our uh, optical network, uh, um, building up a, a brand new open line system all over the uh, uh, the network based on flex grid, uh, flex coherent modulation, able to provide 100 and 400 gig uh, Ethernet services, uh, trying to uh, reach the goal uh, to have uh, open interfaces to uh, uh, configure and uh, work with the, uh, with the optical network. So uh, how uh, this uh, uh, experience with Alien Waves start in uh, GAR very briefly. Uh, as Kurok mentioned, the uh, trial uh, in uh, lab or in uh, field uh, uh, tests is really uh, a, a cornerstone of uh, a network operator that wants to uh, manage and deploy services with the alien waves. We have started in uh, 2016 with extensive lab and field trials uh, with the alien waves. Uh, this make uh, us able to um, uh, somehow uh, point out operational aspects, uh, evaluate interconnection schemas, uh, uh, evaluate uh, in a first-hand experience uh, which are the performance that we can uh, achieve with uh, this solution and which is the impact on the host system, the native legacy uh, system, uh, in a uh, direct way. Uh, another point really uh, important to stick with is the uh, internal knowledge that you can uh, um, uh, deploy and implement in your organization uh, dealing the, directly with uh, uh, the, uh, um, the network solution uh, in lab and field trials. Uh, the more you can um, somehow uh, involve the uh, network engineer within your organization in the deployment, uh, uh, design, uh, evaluation phases of the uh, overall solution with Alien Waves, uh, the best the operational knowledge and skills uh, uh, you will have in your uh, live network uh, during the, uh, the operation. So uh, we have started with lab field trial. We have evaluated uh, the impact and the possible interconnection schema. Uh, we have spread this knowledge all across our uh, organization. Uh, after that, we are currently uh, operating uh, through Alien Waves, uh, uh, the main backbone of our network. So the 100 gig interconnection between the core sites and also some uh, high end uh, user interconnection uh, schema uh, are provided through uh, Alien Waves directly um, delivered on the uh, user sites. <clears throat> How uh, we actually control the, uh, this kind of uh, interconnection and solution. So I have already said we are running uh, an Infinera super channel based uh, Alien Waves on top of a uh, on, on off keying uh, based and compensated um, line system. Uh, we control uh, this uh, uh, infrastructure uh, using actually the, the two separated uh, network management system. This is a key point. Uh, 
is a legacy deployment. So uh, we have a line system uh, provided by Huawei. We use the Huawei U2000 NMS for the uh, cross connection and uh, the channel uh, management. And we use a, a, a DNA uh, NMS in order to operate transponders, super channels, and, and so on. For example, uh, for the monitoring uh, uh, task, uh, uh, well, I want to underline that the, we operate all the optical layer through uh, this kind of uh, uh, NMS. Uh, uh, must have a point uh, uh, to turn up this kind of solution is uh, uh, opti op um, optical monitoring uh, um, that, that must be granular and uh, really spread all over the network. Actually, we have uh, uh, optical spectrum analyzer at uh, every RODM in our network, and we have a fine grain uh, capability to equalize uh, uh, each uh, WSS crossed all over the network. On the transponder side, another must have point is uh, the capability to uh, finely and granularly uh, check out and monitor uh, uh, digital uh, performances so you have uh, you need uh, and it's really useful to have uh, uh, a rich set of uh, performance indicator and uh, monitoring capabilities uh, we do that with the uh, dlv a uh, digital link viewer facility through the um, uh, dna uh, nms uh, we used to deal with the q value uh, and uh, uh, other parameters in order to have the right uh, the, the proper performance uh, in, all over the network uh, how is going so uh, really uh, quickly and briefly uh, uh, I, I try to highlight how we turn a legacy system in a fairly open uh, line system uh, now we want to move on from this situation uh, through a, uh, an open optical uh, line system that uh, uh, in our expectation is engineered and designed uh, in order to have uh, to reach all the points that uh, uh, has been highlighted during this, uh, this session. So uh, the capability to uh, host uh, spectrum, the capability to, to be configured through uh, APIs and to be finally configured in terms of uh, modulation and, uh, and, um, and uh, spectrum flexibility. Uh, we have decided to go with the, the GARTI uh, project uh, with a, a huge refresh of our network um, approaching this uh, this problem with uh, uh, a partially disaggregated paradigm in the uh, in the optical layer uh, as you may see in the overall uh, optical network architecture that we are uh, we have uh, highlighted uh, open line system as a, a current store role and we want to uh, make the network able to deploy and provide the spectrum services light path and other uh, functionalities over the, uh, the optical fiber uh, this really briefly is the network footprint and schema that we uh, want to uh, uh, deploy. Uh, it's a huge network refresh. Uh, there are some details, uh, but um, the thing that I want to underline is the possibility is really granular and disseminated all, all over our community and organizations. The things that I want to underline that in, in this way we could uh, be able to uh, provide to our uh, users uh, the flexible access to the spectrum even in the peripheral uh, nodes uh, uh, even nodes uh, that, that that has uh, two rec unit uh, footprints this is uh, really a, a great result um, uh, as already said that during this uh, this session uh, Open optical network is not just a, a matter of uh, optical uh, uh, layer, it's a matter of how the, the network is uh, managed, configured, and uh, it can be monitored. Uh, we, uh, we are on the way to uh, start a, a deployment uh, and development phase uh, uh, step by step during the real network uh, uh, rollout uh, in order to achieve these four uh, points, network visibility, network performance monitoring, and log event uh, management. Uh, we want to uh, achieve a cross-layer uh, approach in order to have uh, both line system, DCIs, and maybe also other layer 
managed uh, through a, a unique uh, interface. So we will uh, leave our double monitor with uh, two different NMSs in order to monitor uh, the, uh, the optical network. This, is, uh, uh, this could be a great improvement for, for us. Uh, network automation uh, for sure provisioning is a, a great goal to be uh, achieved. Uh, highly wave spectrum sharing, uh, we, we want uh, one of the cornerstone of our uh, network uh, evolution path is the ability to uh, give spectrum access through uh, our uh, users. So it's uh, really uh, crucial for us. Uh, the other point is uh, network design and planning. As uh, um, Kurash already says, uh, Alien Wave uh, designing, planning, uh, testing is really a, uh, um, a difficult task. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, sometimes uh, you need to uh, approximate the results uh, uh, somehow with the upper bounds and stuff like this. Uh, the, the capability to have a third party autonomous way to deploy, to plan and design uh, services across uh, uh, a line system is really uh, crucial in order to be independent somehow from uh, vendors. Uh, this uh just some conclusion we have uh, uh we are refreshing our network uh, uh, taking a lot of uh, uh, experience in the, from uh, from the past uh, basically i want to stick again to uh, one point operational aspects are crucial and uh, uh, the way to go uh, from our perspective uh, uh, to be somehow to get the alien wave and open line system feasible within our organization is to have a really spread knowledge and knowledge base in uh, in this side of the story optical uh, network uh, at uh, really at every level from the operational to the design phase more uh, more spread as uh, as we can is really uh, a key point it's all from my my side uh, thanks, Paolo. That was, that was great. Um, I have uh, one question for you. You talked about um, Rodem's integrated uh, with uh, Optical Spectrum Analyzer. Um, is that with uh, all your vendors or uh, one particular vendor? Well, uh, we have uh, uh, mainly this capability uh, with all our vendors. All vendors. Uh, Yes. Uh, uh, actually, I want to come back with the with the, uh, with this point. Uh, the we had this opportunity also with our legacy network that we built it up in two thousand eleven. Uh, well, at that time, uh, was not so usual to have uh, all these uh, uh, spectrum analyzers spread all over the network, right. and uh, for sure. This uh, uh, opportunity makes us definitely was a, a mandatory uh, feature that make us uh, uh, able to uh, to configure alien wavelengths uh, in uh, in our network. That's very interesting uh, observation. Uh, okay, thanks for that. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, so that we can stay on track, I'd like to go to the next speaker. So, uh, Thomas. Uh, if you could uh, share your screen. So Thomas is going to talk about uh, the work he's been doing in collaboration with the Telecom Infra Project uh, and evaluating um, uh, different modeling uh, software for, uh, for understanding the performance of optical line systems. Okay. So do you see my screen, please? Yep, we can okay. see that and we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tomáš Horvat. I'm from Cessnet and today I would like to talk about simulation tools for verification of optical network setup. So, first of all, some words about optical modeling. Currently, the SCS team in uh, GN4 project are developing a spectrum service, as, as our colleague mentioned. Uh, this will be a multi-vendor and multi-domain. Typically, the network providers rely on their equipment vendor to model the expected optical performance of the service. So this is not 
easily done within a multi-vendor environments, as the, uh, also colleague mentioned, the main reasons why. So to help solve this, this, this problem, John is evaluating the optical modeling tools to support the new spectrum services. And we deal with the Optim VPI Photonics Opti system and GNPy. And we can start with the Optim. So and the giant or SCS team has the, all of these applications are available. However, uh, we just selected the one of uh, this uh, app so i will mention uh, i will talk about uh, our reasons but the uh, optim is the software has been commercially available since the 1998 and um, as the company from the united states declares it's uh, in use by leading engineers in both academic and industrial organization worldwide um, we can virtually prototyping of optical communication system for increasing productivity and reduce time to market. Uh, as can we see on in this figure, we have uh, we have some the data source and um, pre-encoder and and line code. So the scheme is not very important. With uh, what it exactly is. However, I would like to mention we can evaluate our network or our model uh, in an electrical domain, in an optical domain for the bit error rate, Q factor, and in also by the simulation in an in a optical, optical spectrum. Uh, Sometimes some 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 important features are missing, but the almost all of their application supports the third party tools such as MATLAB or Simulink or different different third party tools or Python language. The second uh, is the VPI Photonics to be precise. It's a VPI transmission maker optical systems which accelerate the design of the new Photonics systems and subsystems for short range access metro and long haul optical transmission systems. If we can compare it with the Optim, and the scheme is almost same. However, the graphical user interface is still very friendly for, for a user. And if you don't know how to start, you can, uh, you can, you can use some examples as is uh, shown in, in, in this figure. It's a one terabit per second OFDM super channel. And um, it's it's same like in, for the Optim, you can evaluate the bit error rate, the Q factor or other, other important parameters. The last one from the commercially available software is the Opti system. It's from the OptiWave. It's a Canadian company also same same screen from the graphical user interface uh, as i mentioned it's almost same for all uh, all softwares and um, you can you can just choose from the library what you exactly need like the amplifiers library vdm multiplexer or optical fibers and then you can define the, your parameters and evaluate uh, I diagram or signal power or OSNR polarization stats. It depends what are you currently simulating. The last uh, tool is the GNPy. It's a Gaussian noise simulation in a Python. So it uh, it means it's based on a Python programming language and it provides a set of future structures around the core engine that takes care of propagation effects and the quality of transmission estimation. On the right side, we have, uh, we have um, like the structure of uh, GNPy on, uh, on top is a, it's a AP and uh, client light interface. It's, a, it's, a, it's a mostly about client light interface and you just call the engine with your input file, uh, which should be uh, either XLS from the Excel or the JSON, it's a JavaScript object notation, where, you are, where is uh, described the topology and, and services and the path. And then we call um, core engine, which is uh, programmed in, in, in a Python and 
however is the chain pi is open it you can you can change the engine or you can evaluate it um, engine but uh, is not necessary if you just want to obtain uh, the generalized signal to noise ratio over the your fuel occupy the spectrum in a in a c band so here we have um, some details about GNPi engines in comparison with the commercially available software. The quality of transmission of an established light bus does not remain constant, uh, but decreases as the past time passes due to increased interference from the new light bus. The, we can say the utilization of the network is light at the beginning of its life and increase as more connections are established. Furthermore, established or estimating the uh, quality of transmission of the live voice is a key functionality that is typically performed by a Q tool. Uh, I found the mentioning of the Q tool in a, in, a, in an article. Unfortunately, I was not able to find the, that Q tool uh, to evaluate this this APP, which is used when planning, upgrading, or operating an optical network. So. Uh, SCST or the Spectrum Connection Service team uh, chose the GNPi, and here are some reasons why we exactly chose the GNPi. First of all, it's an open source solution with the extended users user base. It's also designed to support the multi-vendor and remains for open line system, which is necessary for our purpose does not require any license fee for usage and also for the support. The engine is under development with the more transceivers, for, for example. Mostly it, it does not um, require the Python programming language skills because you will just call uh, the GN by engine. You don't need to uh, you don't need to change it or however you can improve it and provides the either XLS or JSON input file and does not require installation. It's also possible to use it as a web-based service is a gnpy.app. However, I don't recommend it because uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's necessary to call the gnpy uh, locally and it's, um, it's, it's better to evaluate it in on your machine. Or we currently use the Linux virtual machine to operate the GNPi. Our experiences with the GNPi tool, the um, Spectrum Consciousness System was evaluated 